Well, you'll notice in your outline that this session has a much different looking outline than the other outlines. And there's a reason for that. I call it the Romans Road for the 21st century. Now, some of you might have been trained in evangelism to use Romans to share the gospel because the longest treatise on salvation in the Bible is the book of Romans. And uh, I want to show you how I use the book of Romans in a witnessing situation. But uh, what I have going on here is uh, a kind of resource for you. And so... Obviously, unbelievers have a great deal of false presuppositions. I have boiled it down to just a few on the, on the front page here. And then I've keyed that to my outline on Romans. And so you'll see in parentheses which verses in Romans answer the objection. So notice the first objection. There's a lack of proof that the God of the Bible exists. That's handled in that number one point. The cosmos and everything in it's the result of blind natural forces. That's handled in the second one. It is a personal freedom to decide right and wrong for oneself. That's handled in the outline three and four, parts three and four. There are many ways to God, four, five, seven, eight. Answer that area. And then all the way through. So for this to really be useful to you, You'll just have to kind of study it on your own. Sometimes I recommend people, if you're doing a, a Bible study over coffee some morning, just go through these Romans verses until they are ready at your fingertips. And that's another kind of feedback I had on the break. Uh, I think it was Wendy came up to me and she said, you know, I, I, I fear that, no, she didn't say that. She said, I think that uh, we have to be careful that we're not imparting to people a technique when actually... It is our knowledge of Scripture we're recalling when we answer objections and when we present the gospel. The more able you are to bring verses to mind and where to locate them, the better prepared you'll be for evangelism. Pretty, pretty evident, isn't it? So the Romans Road for the 21st century. The Romans Road I was trained in uh, years ago in the 1970s was a Romans Road that began in Romans 3. I've added chapter 1 and 2. And that's why I call it a Romans road for the 21st century because in the 1970s we had a far less percentage of the population that was atheist than we do today. So right, why not bring in Romans 1 and 2? Well, one of the ways I used this was again on an airplane, my favorite place to witness. <laughs> I was on a flight from St. Louis, Missouri back to California and it was a full flight and I sat somewhere where I'll never sit again. It was the tail section where you're in the fetal position next to the window. Everything's low, the ceiling, everything. And I began praying, Lord, give me someone I can share the gospel with. And so uh, these were the last seats in the plane. And this big lug of a guy came in and he, he threw down his bag and he kicked it under the seat and, and cursed. And I said, thank you, Lord. I think I have a prospect. <laughs> thank you. So we just exchanged names and, and made some small talk and found out he was a concrete engineer who travels around and inspects different sites, see if the forms are proper for pouring the concrete and so on. And, and I said, what do you do for fun? He goes, my friends and I get together and we smoke marijuana until we're in a practical stupor. So I'm thinking, okay, how does this work? A concrete engineer and a pothead, how does this go together? I'm not sure I'd want to be in one of his buildings that he inspected. <laughs> his name was Nick. I said, Nick, have you ever seen a map to eternal life? He said, no. Can I show it to you? <laughs> now, all I did was mentally use the book of Romans as an outline, which is creation, conscience, sin, salvation, sanctification, Service. That's my own outline of Romans. Creation, conscience, sin, salvation, sanctification, service. And so we just dug right in. I showed him creation and that he's a creature made in the image of God. He's accountable to God. And then I got to the sin chapter on conscience and the law in chapters, one and, in chapters 2 and 3. And he goes, I'm not sure I want to hear that part. I said, well... Can you imagine trying to use a map if you don't know where you are? It's useless. 
Let's at least locate where you are in the eye of God. He is the divine GPS. And so he goes, okay, all right, we'll keep going, okay. So we made it all the way to the end, not the part about service and sanctification, but mostly what needs to be done if you're going to repent and come to faith. And he goes, man, I, I really like, I'm really glad I met you. This, this is incredible. This is profound. I, I like 95% of what you've said. <laughs> I said, what's the 5% you don't like? He says, well, I didn't tell you that when my friends and I are high on pot, we fight demons. And you know what the good news is? We're winning. And he says, I don't like the fact that I need Christ in order to fight demons. I said, well, the demon's stock and trade is deception. You may think you're winning, but in thinking you're winning, you're losing. You can't win without Christ who came to destroy the works of the devil. And we know from passages like Matthew 4 that when Christ took on the devil, he used spiritual weapons. How did he defeat the devil so that he left Christ alone? A phrase he kept repeating, it is written. It is written. The almighty, infallible word of God by which all things are made, upheld, and will be restored is the powerful sword of the Spirit to defeat the enemy. He goes, wow, that's, that's really good. Man, I'm so glad I met you. So he sat there and he just kind of stewed on this for about 10 minutes. And uh, he hadn't believed yet. And so then he says, well, what about the Crusades? So that was his objection. What about the Crusades? As if the Crusaders somehow meant that the message of Scripture wasn't reliable. I just gave him a short answer on that, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what Nick did, but I want you to see that using the book of Romans as a gospel tool is very convenient because you can take them all the way through creation and conscience and sin and salvation all in one book. And so that's what this resource is about. I've captured the very verses under each section, and uh, I've given a little headline here and a number. If you just leaf, leaf through your outline briefly there, you can see how to lead a person through the gospel plan of salvation. Now, usually if I only have five minutes with a person, I'm not going to use the Romans road. But someone who wants to talk about it, they're interested in hearing the plan of salvation, and I've got at least 20 minutes with them, I'll take them through the Romans road. All right, well, we know from Romans that the lie in the Garden of Eden is the lie behind all lies because it was uttered by the father of lies and Jesus says in John 8, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. And this lie murdered our first parents. This lie corrupted human reason. Now, we can still build incredible structures and send a man to the moon, but human reasoning has been corrupted by the lie, by original sin, by the fall. And so if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to read 1 through 6, and uh, I believe this morning that if we got a little insight into what this lie offered and how it corrupted human reason, we'll be better able to understand the unbeliever's condition. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Okay, what part did Eve add as an edit? Which, touch it, that's correct. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. The Edenic lie offered wisdom through sinning. It offer, also offered that human beings would be the final arbiters of truth. You could almost say that the lie offered 
a lifestyle of independence from God, autonomy from God. You'll be like God. By gaining knowledge, you'll be able to transcend your creaturehood. You'll be something other than a bounded, limited creature. You'll be able to know good and evil and choose right and wrong for yourselves without the consequence of death and damnation. You will have found reasons, by eating the fruit, you will have found reasons for living a self-directed life free from the invasive oppression of divine control. And so this lie is really quite complex philosophically. It offered independence. You'd be the final arbiter of truth. You'd be like God. You won't face death and damnation. You can choose right and wrong for yourself. And you will have found the reason for living a self-directed life out from underneath the thumb of your maker. Now this tells us a lot about how the natural man thinks today. For every little baby born into the world has this lie attached to its heart. Like the tentacles of some alien life form, this lie is attached to the heart of every single person. Not in the same wording, but in the same amount of bleak darkness the Puritans referred to original sin as nature's night. Nature's night of the soul. So each of those three things offered, autonomy from God, being like God, transcending creaturehood, and so on, each of those is centered around. In fact, the liberty that the devil promised is ultimately loyalty to self, self-love. And that's important to realize that because this helps us understand what our unbelieving friends are thinking. I teach a class at Masters on counseling, <clears throat> biblical counseling. And uh, in biblical counseling, we say that the real you is the worshiping self. The most, imp the most important thing about you is who or what you worship. But for the secular psychologist, the most important thing about you is the sacred self and its yearnings. That's the holy of holies that nothing must violate. The sacred self is the holy of holies. It is, it is guarded from all intrusion. In fact, unbelievers think that the most important way to be loyal to yourself is to never let anything in there other than the love of self. Now, in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul tells us that the effect of this lie upon the human race was a series of exchanges. So let's look at Romans 1, shall we? Romans chapter 1. And again, this is giving us great insights into how unbelievers actually think <clears throat> about their imagined independence from God. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 23, that they profess to be wise, and then by doing so, they exchange the glory of God the incorruptible God for the image in the form of corruptible man, of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. There was an exchange of glory. Now this glory exchange alludes to the fact that the children of Israel had Aaron make a golden calf. And they gave their loyalty and their praise to a golden calf, an ox, instead of to God. That's an exchange of glory. But I would dare say this, that today's evolutionist is committing a very similar sin. He's exchanging the glory of knowing the one true creator who deserves all glory and honor, and he's giving credit to amoebas and tadpoles and prosimians. <laughs> he's giving his credit to creatures for his origin. That's an exchange of glory. Out of an exchange of glory was an exchange of truth. Verse 25. And they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Now one of my mentors, Dr. Peter Jones of Westminster Seminary Escondido says in his New Testament course, there's a reason why it says the lie. That is an articular lie. In other words, that is the lie, the original lie. That original lie involved an exchange of truth for falsehood. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Out of the exchange of glory and the exchange of truth, 
comes the exchange of function. And the very first physical sin mentioned in Romans 1 is homosexuality itself. This is important for us to understand. Dr. Peter Jones and I traveled in nine different states and were speaking on Romans 1. We came to University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and we asked the leader of University, uh, Reform University Fellowship if he would let Peter Jones speak to his Christian students. And I'll never forget it. I was having lunch with this gentleman in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he goes, Jay, he goes, I've got 150 students in my Christian organization on campus. If I gave the most winsome, understanding, compassionate, biblical teaching on what the Bible says about homosexuality, three-fourths of those 150 kids would never, ever come back. That's how terrified they are of marginalization. Now, something similar happened to us at University of Central Florida. <clears throat> We're talking to the campus crusade leader there, and that's a group closer to about 500 kids. Can we have Peter Jones speak to your student body? to your Christians, I mean, to your Christian students. And his answer was, I'm sorry, we believe that Christian ministry here is a kind of hospital, not a place for dogmatic truth. And so we were bumped from both campuses because of the terror that we'd be marginalized if we told the truth. <clears throat> and so really what Peter Jones was doing and speaking on this topic in Romans 1 was giving the spiritual cause behind the advocacy of homosexuality. And that's what Paul is telling us here. It has a spiritual cause. If you suppress the truth and speculate and stop giving thanks, profess yourself wise, exchange the truth of God for the lie, exchange the glory of God for created things, you will ultimately approve of perversion. Now, brethren, we have to be armed with this. If we're going to bring an answer to the world, we have to know this is a spiritual cause. It's not just loosening up things through endless democratization. There's a spiritual cause behind this. Worshiping the creation is a very unnatural way of living. Therefore, it produces a very unnatural way of relating to others. Well, God tells us in Romans 1 that this exchange of truth, this exchange of glory, and this exchange of function comes with wrath revealed now. Wrath that is a precursor of eternal wrath if these people do not repent. When I say these people, I mean all unbelievers. And so with these three exchanges, God responds with three givings over. Three givings over. They're given over to impure lusts of the heart, verse 24. They're given over to degrading passions, verse 26. They're given over to a reprobate, depraved mind, verse 28. This is wrath revealed now. And God says he's going to pour out his wrath or reveal his wrath in verse 18. But there is a comfort. The same Greek word for given over, paradidomi, is the same Greek word used in Romans 8. When God did not withhold his own son, but gave him over to be crucified for us. Brethren, we have a message of hope, a message of cleansing, a message of a new creation. And this is hard for our modern people to reconcile. How can God be absolutely just and yet perfectly loving? How can he be absolutely just and filled with wrath and yet attract us with love and compassion? How can that happen? And our job is to keep bringing those together by the message of the cross, is it not? We keep bringing that together in that way. Well, this original lie birthed in us every imaginable false philosophy. And this lie also created a particular sentiment toward the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. That fall from glory was a forfeiture of glory. 
We forfeited the sight of God's glory. We forfeited the love of God's glory. And we forfeited the ability to reflect God's glory. Therefore, salvation, if it's to truly reverse our problem, must restore what the fall forfeited. It must restore the sight of God's glory, which God does in the face of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It must restore our love of God's glory. And every true believer has a passion for God's glory. And it also must restore our ability to reflect God's glory. And by the new birth and the Spirit's indwelling, we have that ability. And ultimately, we'll reflect that glory perfectly in heaven, right? This all goes together so beautifully. And yet in the mind of the natural man, God's glory and man's good are at odds. And that's what Satan offered Eve. How can you give your life to a God who's holding out on you? How can you give your life to a God who's holding back from you? Look at the beauty of that tree. Practically looks like something from... Uh, What's that movie where uh, Avatar, it looks like the tree in Avatar. How can he, how, he's holding back on you. Look at the, the delicious fruit he's holding out on you. And he's also threatened by your human potential. You could be little gods. Doesn't sound like a god you want to serve, does it? And so Satan is casting this false dichotomy between God's glory and your good. And I dare say every unbeliever you talk to has that wedge driven between God's glory and their good. They assume it's a conflict of interest. And as soon as you start preaching, that conflict of interest fear starts erecting itself. It's a conflict of interest. God's glory and my good are a conflict of interest. That's what Satan sold to Eve, a conflict of interest. And that conflict of interest is only removed by the message of a crucified Savior. When the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of the heart and that unbeliever sees for the first time, oh my goodness, the Son of God was pumping out His heart's blood onto dusty Judean soil for the likes of me that I might go from wretchedness to adoption? Oh my goodness, I give. Lord, I fall down before you. It's the message of Christ crucified that rejoins in the mind of a man or woman that God's glory and your good are joined in the person of the Son of God. God's glory and your good come together again for the first time. And the gospel has the ability to evict the lie told in the Garden of Eden. The gospel's got that power. And so when I'm sharing the gospel, the conflict of interest between glory and good, and only the message of Christ's love can rejoin those. And he does so in his own person and work. He rejoins the two. So because unbelievers are buying into this conflict of interest view of glory and good, they embrace what's called a Gentile cosmology. What is a Gentile cosmology? It's either a world controlled by spirits or a world it was, is that the world was no longer viewed as a place controlled by spirits. You realize how much of the world still believes that the earth is controlled by spirits and not by a transcendent God? Christianity changed that. So in Gentile cosmology, we call it a materialistic worldview that everything can be explained by matter and motion. Everything is traceable to molecules. That worldview is behind today's moral revolution. Look at all the things they're fighting for today in terms of perversity. Why are erotic rights eclipsing religious rights because of Gentile cosmology. That's at the bottom. That's at the bottom of it. <clears throat> In Gentile cosmology, everything wicked gets normalized. The darkened mind normalizes the abnormal. Evil, death, suffering, injustice, decay, extinction, all these things are normal rather than what they really are, a result of of sin's intrusion. So the unbeliever uses his darkened mind to normalize the abnormal. He uses his darkened mind to desacralize the sacred. And what is God called sacred? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Marriage is the first holy institution. And the very things that God has said are sacred, the natural man is desacralizing or desecrating by his philosophies and behavior. The natural man is also naturalizing the supernatural. In other words, the things that God has done to make you a new creature. God is doing miracles. He's making believers as new creatures through the new birth. What a miracle that is. But everything miraculous, the miracles of Christ, the creation of the universe, the natural man naturalizes the supernatural. And in so doing, he envisions a disenchanted world. Now, I'm not using the word disenchanted the way a Disney movie would. <laughs> disenchanted in this context means a world without the fingerprints of Almighty God, a world that made itself, a world that just happened by itself. I think about, I was a science major in college before I was saved, and so I'm very attracted to life science and so on, and every time I see an article about a new robot that engineers have made. In fact, when I was writing my manuscript here, I, I wrote that there's a robotic dog that can stand up on its hind legs, obey commands, walk over all kinds of terrain, and I forgot to add that as of last week, the robotic dog can do backflips. Now here's the amazing thing. Scientists can make a robotic spider or robotic dog but do they really realize they're just thinking a tiny, tiny afterthought of God's thought on how that creature would be using locomotion? They still have to have computers and wires and everything else, but the one thing they didn't write the program for was a creature that could recognize its mate, eat, sleep, have metabolism, recognize prey, recognize an enemy, and countless other things, all compacted into a nano into a nanogenetic code so tiny we couldn't even see it with the naked eye, and yet it could build a dog, a spider, whatever, with all its behaviors, all its instincts, everything necessary to thrive. Remarkable. And yet these men say, we designed a robotic dog after a dog that was not designed. <laughs> There's a breakdown there somewhere. Now, God has filled the universe with his fingerprints, countless fingerprints. We could liken these countless fingerprints to a turtle on a fence post. A turtle does not have the anatomy to climb up a fence post. Even a little farm boy walking home from school, if he saw a turtle on a fence post, he would say, ha, what clever fella put that there. Poor turtle. He has no way to get down except fall. But in terms of God's creation, he has filled it with, metaphorically, turtles on fence posts. Where any rational look at a design, you'd have to say, intelligent designer, marvelous, intelligent design, incredible, intelligent design. And yet, Darwin said something like this, okay, I admit things really, really look designed, but they're not. That's the cosmology behind today's moral revolution. I want you to understand that these are very important bedfellows. Today's moral revolution needs Darwinism to back it up. Both Stalin and Hitler in their pre-death memoirs wrote notes of thanks to Darwin for giving them a scientific justification for their purges. Hitler began killing handicapped people before he killed Jews because he thought he was driving the evolutionary process forward. Something we need to know about a person's worldview is that they did not select their worldview by carefully examining the evidence. Worldview is a function of heart commitment. Before a person ever lands on a worldview, he's choosing a heart commitment that will allow him to think he's autonomous from God. That's so vital. Because sometimes when we witness, we think it's our job to deconstruct their worldview and talk them out of it. The real issue is a heart commitment to independence from God. Heart commitments generate worldviews. It's so critical we understand that. 
So the unbeliever has a kind of controversy with God. This controversy is a refusal to bow before his creator. Remember, God has an absolute claim on our lives. He owns us. He created us. He's got the right to tell us what to believe and how to live. And I often tell my unbelieving friends, you know, the big fight today is for identity. S-O-G-I, SOGI laws, sexual orientation, gender identity. Sexual orientation, gender identity, S-O-G-I. SOGI laws are being made every month. And it's all about identity, identity driven. That's where these laws are coming from. And see, the vacuum left by denying we're made in the image of God is allowing these false philosophies to come rushing in, such as personhood theory. Did you know in Holland today, in the Netherlands, a van drives around, and all you, do, all you have to do is make a phone call, and they will euthanize you and take your body away. They'll come to your home. My friends, the brave new world is here. It's all a fruit of Gentile cosmology. It's probably coming to Canada, maybe America next. And so this particular view of man is so cruel that Vishal Mongolwadi described it this way after some of the terminology from C.S. Lewis's books. If you amputate the soul from man, he falls naked and headlong into a black cesspool filled with razor wire. And that's a picture, my friends, that's a metaphorical picture of nihilism. Because in that black cesspool is the complete absence of human worth and dignity and identity. This is why people are fighting so hard to make up an identity through gender identity and gender and, and identity politics. Everybody's got to be part of a group. If you're this race, then you have nothing to say to another race. If you're this gender, you have nothing to say to another gender. Everything is being blocked into cultural Marxist categories so we have these badges pinned on us and you've got to own your badge and own your group. That's all because of one great thing. We've denied we're made in the image of God. So when I'm talking to an unbeliever, I'll often say something like this. Can you, can I, would you just walk with me onto biblical turf for a moment? According to God Almighty, you don't know who you really are until you know who you're created to reflect. You don't know who you are until you know who you're created to reflect. You are designed to reflect God. What is an image? An image is an image of something else. You're the image of the Creator. Now, Francis Schaeffer tells an amusing story that uh, at Labrie, which was his Swiss retreat for seekers, uh, one young married couple uh, left the light on all night. And so uh, Francis Schaefer was talking to them over breakfast, and he said, uh, was there something wrong with the accommodations? Oh, no, no. Uh, we're just newlyweds. We love each other, and we don't want to waste a single minute. We want to know each other almost exhaustively. And so what did Schaefer say? I care for you guys, but I want to tell you why you're going to fail <laughs> in knowing each other exhaustively. Because only one being knows you exhaustively, and that's your maker. And your attempt to know each other exhaustively without God bringing you together is going to be a failed attempt. Because I just met you, but I know more who you are than you know who you are. You're made in the image and likeness of God for a love relationship with your Creator, and you can't know who you are until you know who you're created to reflect. My friends, that's your created purpose. Christ came to earth to restore us to our created purpose so that in all our relationships we would glorify God as his image bearers. All our relationships are to be the category or the arena in which we reflect our maker. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is the reflection of our creator, is it not? These are so basic and yet you can graduate from public universities today and hear none of this. The day Obama was elected to his first term, I took a group of students to CalArts University, my favorite hangout, and I had a little sheet of paper which said, Law Theory. 
And I just grabbed a group of students and I said, uh, can we make a video and you guys form a panel and we just basically tape what you say? Well, we'd love to form a panel, we just don't want to be videotaped. And so the questions went something like this. What's the connection between law of man and law of God? Where do they join? Law of God and law of man. Next question. What's the connection between law and morality? Next question. What's the connection between morality and conscience? Next question. What's the connection between conscience and judgment day? And we've all heard that little poem. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. And so after they tried to answer all these questions in the law theory handout sheet, I gave the biblical answer to those questions. And I had drama majors, I had dance majors, and I had gay people in that group. And, you, and you'd be amazed at the answers. This one woman who was a dance major, she said, we're not allowed to talk about things like this at this school. She says, I want to get a bunch of students together and have you come back and open this topic up because it's desperately needed. Then another dance major said, I think what you're saying is true. My life needs a ton of work after hearing this. And so brethren, we have the truth in our hands. We have reality. We're testifying to reality when we share these things with unbelievers. And there's a work of correspondence going on. It was certainly true among these dance and drama majors on that particular day. 